Excellent. So, um, today's topic is using DNA to solve unknown parentage cases. And those unknown parentage cases could be foundlings, they could be adoptees, they could be an illegitimate grandfather, for example. How many ha people have a foundling in their family tree? Anybody? One, one person? Yeah? Anybody got adoptions or adoptees in their family tree? Quite a few more people. Anybody have illegitimacies in their family tree? <laughs> well, uh, you're in great company today. <laughs> so, uh, that's very interesting to see. Now, how many people have done a DNA test? And again, the majority of the audience have done a DNA test. There must be about 60 or 70 people in the audience, I'm guessing, maybe a bit more than that. But um, DNA is really a great way forward in solving these type of cases. Because after you have, a, and here's the average family tree, certainly from an Irish point of view, you can see that this is me down here, born about 1960, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. I've identified about half of my great-great-great-grandparents who would have been born around about 1800, and that's after uh, exhausting all of the usual sources like family lore, the letters in the attic, uh, the family bible, uh, the 1901 and 1911 census information in Ireland, and then before that we have Griffith's valuation as a census substitute, the cancelled books of the land valuation office, uh, birth, marriage and deaths uh, from the civil registration, and then church records that uh, go back to around about the 1800 time point, but they get patchier and patchier as you go back in time. And then, of course, more recently, we've been collaborating with uh, websites like Genes Reunited, My Heritage, Ancestry, that type of thing. Um, and then there's other uh, sources like the newspapers, which are constantly being digitized now and being made available online. Uh, we've got Glass Nevin Cemetery records, very, very good for anybody with Dublin ancestors. And of course, the electoral rolls, all of which are gradually appearing online. But at the end of all of that, we are left with this great big brick wall. And for those of you who have Irish ancestry, it's usually around about the 1800 to 1830 time point. How many people have Irish ancestral lines that end around? OK, well, everybody has. So um, it's, it's very, very common. But using DNA, uh, you can actually break through some of these brick walls. And I'll give you a few examples of how that can happen from my own uh, experience. Uh, this one here uh, in the middle was uh, the Spiran line. Patrick Spiran married to Mary Morgan. We'll be hearing more about the Spirans and the Morgans later on. So that's our brick wall. But an adoptee's brick wall, well, if they know who their birth mother is, they may not know who their birth father is. Their brick wall might be around about the time of their birth father. Or if they have no information at all about their birth parents, then their brick wall is right there around about the 1930 time point if they were born around about 1960. So it may have been due to an informal or secret adoption. Could be because there was an illegal adoption. And recently in Ireland, we've discovered that up to 15,000 people, 15,000 Irish citizens, were illegally adopted. And the names of their adoptive parents were put on the birth certificate instead of the names of the natural parents. So there is no documentation about the natural parents. And that means that the only recourse they have is to do DNA. Um, and for a lot of people, uh, this will be uh, an instant reconnection, and I'll show you some uh, examples of that as we go through. So taking a DNA test is relatively straightforward. Most of you have done one. You either give a, a cheek swab or a saliva sample. That goes into a little test tube, and then it gets posted off to the lab. And in the lab, they look at your sample, they go, oh, blue blood must be royalty. <laughs> and they put it through their machine, and at the other end, it comes out as a set of DNA results on your own privatized web page on the website of the company you test with. And that's protected by your username and password. And you have various degrees of privacy depending on your own comfort levels. You can use a false name. There is no compunction to use your real name. You can use initials. You can use a nickname. Don't use Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Everybody will want to be your cousin. Um, not only do they give you your own results, but they compare your results to everybody else in the database. And they give you a list of your matches. 
and um, you will have thousands of matches. Just concentrate on the top 10%, and for goodness sake, do not add them to your Christmas card list. <laughs> you will get writer's cramp. And then other uh, websites like Family Tree DNA offer the facility to create your own DNA projects, particularly surname projects. So I run the Gleason DNA project, the Spiram DNA project, Farrell DNA project, and Ryan DNA project, where we try to find out where did the surname come from, how long have people in the project been carrying that surname, and who is most closely related to everybody else. So taking a quicker look at the DNA that you've put into that test tube, whether it's a scraping from your cheek or a white cell in your saliva, uh, this is what a cell looks like. And in the middle you have the green nucleus of the cell. These little blue things here are the mitochondria. And they contain mitochondrial DNA, and that's passed from women down to all of their children, but only the daughters pass it on to their children, and their daughters pass it on to their children. Men do not pass on mitochondrial DNA. And because it's only the women that pass it on, it's very useful for tracking back along the mother, 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 mother line. Um, within the nucleus of the cell, we have 46 chromosomes arranged into 23 pairs. We have two copies of chromosome 1, we have two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, and so on. One copy in the pair is from your mother, one copy is from your father. One copy is maternal, one copy is paternal. And when we get down to the last pair in this uh, sequence of chromosomes, pair number 23 are known as the sex chromosomes, and there are two types of sex chromosome. There's the X chromosome, or there's the Y chromosome. And women will have two X chromosomes, and they will look like this. And men will have an X and a Y chromosome, and... <laughs> well, how disappointing is that? So that's how, those are the, the, the chromosomes that determine what gender you are. And uh, the Y chromosome is much shorter than the X chromosome, so you can see that, on average, uh, your, your average woman is more of a person than your average man. <laughs> so there are three main types of DNA tests as a result of this. The Y DNA test, Y DNA is only passed from father to son. It's very useful for going back along the father, father, father line. It has a reach of over 200,000 years. And on the other side of the family tree, the mitochondrial DNA goes back along the mother, mother, mother line. Again, very useful uh, for uh, migration studies and uh, looking at the way that the humans have populated the planet. But in the middle, you have the autosomal DNA. Autosomal is all of the chromosomes apart from that last pair. So it's 22 out of the 23 pairs. Uh, when you do an autosomal DNA test, they usually throw in the X chromosome for free. So with the autosomal DNA test, they're testing all the autosomes, pair number one, all the way up to pair number 22, and they're throwing in the sex chromosomes as well, pair number 23. If you're a woman, you've got two X chromosomes, so you're getting all 46 of your 46 chromosomes. If you're a man, the autosomal test will give you 45 out of the 46. It doesn't give you the Y-DNA, that's a separate test. So Y-DNA, mitochondrial DNA, very useful for deep as well as recent ancestry, but the most useful test is the autosomal DNA. It covers about 95% of the DNA in every cell in your body, and that's the most useful test from a genealogical point of view. From the point of view of adoptees and people with unknown parentage, the Y-DNA can help identify the surname of the birth father, and we'll take a look at that. But the autosomal DNA can identify either the birth mother or the birth father, and both of them have their uses. Mitochondrial DNA is the least useful, and I generally don't use it very much in this type of work. But here are the three main companies that you can test with. Here are the prices in euros. They're going up, they're going down. Uh, there's a sale on at the moment, and you can buy um, Ancestry DNA kits for 95 New Zealand dollars, or you can buy four for the price of three. Since I, I, I gave a similar talk in um, Wellington, and after the talk, 60 kits, 60 people bought kits at Ancestry. So you're, you know, you, your cousins could be among those people who bought those kits. 
In terms of the number of people who are in the databases, uh, there is approximately 1 million at Family Tree DNA, 10 million at Ancestry, and those numbers are just increasing exponentially. There's about 5 million with 23andMe, and they mainly focus on the medical risk assessment. Uh, a lot of people who test with 23andMe have no interest with genealogy, so if you write to them and say, oh, we're a match, uh, let's compare family trees, you may never hear from them again, because they just don't have the interest in genealogy. Uh, MyHeritage has about 2 million people in the database, and LivingDNA has about several tens of thousands, because it's relatively new. But by 2020, I reckon there's going to be about 35 million people in the databases. So in two and a half years' time, at the end of 2020, I'd say there's going to be 35 million, and it means that it's going to be so much easier for all of you to connect with genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor sometime after 1700, or thereabouts. That's six times the Irish population, about eight times the population of New Zealand. So that's a huge amount of people in these databases. My recommended DNA testing strategy is, to, first of all, to test at Ancestry, and then transfer the, a copy of the results, download them to your computer, and upload that copy of your Ancestry results to the other websites for free. That way, you pay for one test, and you get to swim in five gene pools. And that really maximizes the cost-effectiveness of your investment in DNA. Um, you can also test at 23andMe if you get nothing in these first five databases. Uh, 23andMe do not allow their results, uh, well you cannot, uh, you cannot um, upload, you cannot, 23andMe do not up allow uploads, uploads from anybody else and the, the only way that you can actually get into the 23andMe database is to test with 23andMe. So the aim is to fish in as many gene pools as possible, and what do you hope to catch? The big fish. And that big fish is a close match that allows you to identify the birth family of the adoptee, or the foundling, or the person with unknown parentage. And how likely is it? There's a 50% chance you'll succeed in the US within a two-year period. There is a 20% chance everywhere else, and that's based on data from 2016. And these success, success rates will increase all the time, and soon most adoptees will be able to identify a birth family through DNA if that's what they want to do. Because some adoptees might just want to see what their ethnic makeup is. So they'll do the test, and they're not interested in getting in touch with cousins. Or they'll want to identify who the family is, but they may not wish to have any contact with them. So it very, very much depends on the personal preferences of the adoptee. But DNA has a major role and will have a much greater role to play in tracing the family of the adoptee. And here is that survey I talked about, the adoptee serving survey in 2016. And you can see uh, up here, uh, quality of initial matches. When you first received your results, what was your closest match? 2% of people found their parents. 6% of people found their half-siblings. 5% of people found an aunt or an uncle. So about 13% of people altogether found immediate family as soon as they got their DNA results back. Isn't that incredibly powerful? So these, these are outdated results. The numbers are probably higher now, and as we head towards 35 million in two and a half years' time, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and success rates will get higher and higher and higher. Now, in New Zealand, you have uh, certain adoption laws. Are these going to be revised in the near future, or is there some move to try and get the adoption laws relaxed at all? Not, not in the near future. The Irish adoption laws date from the 1970s. And so currently we're in the process of actually updating these adoption laws in Ireland to make it uh, possible for adoptees to access records that previously they were forbidden to get hold of. And uh, myself and a couple of uh, ISOG colleagues, ISOG is the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, so a couple of us that work in Ireland, we wrote a 76-point commentary on the proposed adoption bill 
that may be of interest to you. It's a good general uh, resource, um, but it also includes a lot of useful uh, data in the appendices, including further details of that adoption testing uh, survey in 2016. And that's available for download for free from the ISOG Ireland wiki page. If you just uh, Google ISOG Ireland, it'll take you to the wiki page, and it's item number 11, I believe, and you can download it for free. So turning to the DNA and how it can actually help identify the birth families, first of all, let's take a look at why DNA and how it can help you identify the genetic father of the adoptee or the foundling or the illegitimate grandfather. And remember, Y-DNA goes back along the father, father, father line. And these are the typical Y-DNA results. Now, these results are 12 marker, at the 12 marker level. And this particular person, we'll call him Finbar O'Brien. That's his adopted name. We don't know who he is. He doesn't know who is, what his uh, natural parents were called. But he did the Y-DNA test. And we first compare him at the 12 marker level, and we see he has Massey, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey. So there's only two names that appear uh, in his 12 marker matches. If we increase the comparison level to 25 markers and just look at uh, his seven matches, again we're seeing someone called Massey, Massey, Simmons, 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 Massey, and now somebody called No. And if we increase the level to 37, we're seeing Massey, Simmons, and Simmons. So it's quite clear here that the most likely candidate for the birth father of this particular adoptee would probably be a man called Simmons or Massey, because most of his matches center around those two surnames. Um, and that can be very, very useful information to have if you have maybe some documentary evidence that might be pointing you in a particular direction. So it can help focus your research. And based on 2014 data, 25% um, of people when they do a Y37 test will have no matches at all. About 50% of them will have somewhere between 1 and 10 matches at the 37 marker level. And about 25% will have more than 10 matches. And the inc incidence of a clear signal of your own particular surname among those matches, it was about 10 to 15% in 2014. But of course, since then, the database has been increasing in size, and we now reckon it's somewhere around the 30 to 40 percent mark. There's, there's probably a 30 to 40 percent chance that if you did your Y DNA, and of course only men can do the Y DNA, there's a 30 to 40 percent chance that the surname of your biological father will appear among your list of matches. And this is likely to improve over time as more men test. So that's why DNA, autosomal DNA, can be used for finding one or both birth parents. And this has a reach of about five, six, or seven generations. So this test is going to put you in touch with genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor round about in the last five, six, seven generations. So that's roughly a common ancestor born around about 1700, 1750. It's not going to get back much further than that. It's going to be particularly useful for a common ancestor born in the 1800s, and it gets a little bit less useful the further back in time you go. So if you're a birth mother, for example, and you want to find your birth child, and uh, I recently got, was uh, contacted by an 81-year-old lady. Uh, she had given her child up for adoption in the 1960s. Um, she said, I went into the hospital, I was pregnant, they put me to sleep, I woke up, the child had gone, I don't even know what gender it is. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. And for these last 60 years, I've always wondered what happened to that child. So now she says, I'm at the age of 81, I am doing a DNA test to see if I can find my child. So she gave a DNA sample to all the, uh, she gave, we tested with Ancestry and then transferred it to the other uh, major companies. The results took four to 10 weeks. If her child was in the database, it would be a 50% match, an instant reconnection. If the grandchild, so if the, her child had had children of their own, there would be a grandchild in the database. And then, of course, she'd get lots of other relatives that she really wasn't interested in uh, contacting. We, we completely privatized her name. We only used initials, and we didn't use her initials. 
Um, we could also have used a bespoke email address. We could have invented a, an email address just for this exercise, and we could have named it 1234567 at gmail.com. So there's ways of privatizing your identity that actually protects you so that you can actually be in control of who sees who you are and who doesn't. In the end, she doesn't have any matches in the databases. So at the age of 81 now, she's left the DNA there, and it's the gift that keeps on giving, because as more people join the databases, if there is a close match, she will get notified that you have a very close match in the database, and hopefully sometime in the next uh, couple of months or couple of years, she will get a close match, and she'll find the child she gave up for adoption 60 years ago. But if she dies before she finds that child, her DNA is there as a legacy, so that if any of her descendants come looking for her at any time in the future, this DNA will tell them, mother came looking for you. So it's very important, because it's an emotional roller coaster, this type of investigation, to, to have, I say, have your letters ready. Write a letter to your child. Write a letter to your birth parents. Say, you know, to say what you want to say to, say to them. Um, and also have your support network around you, have your friends around you, have your family around you, have a social worker or even a, a professional counsellor on hand to give you the advice and the support that you need on those ups and on those downs. For an adoptee, it's a very similar kind of process. You give a DNA sample, it goes to the major testing companies. Four to ten weeks later, you might find your parent in the database They'll be a 50% match. You share 50% of your DNA with them. Um, a half-sibling will be a 25% uh, match. And then other relatives, nephew, cousin, and so on. Again, have your letters ready. Have your support network alerted. And here is an example uh, from my own experience. This is probably the first adoptee that I worked with. And this is Winnie. Uh, she was 75 years old when she contacted me. Um, uh, she told me in her email that she was raised with nine children. She always felt different. She'd been searching for her birth family for 35 years, and she waited until her adopted parents had died before starting her search for her birth family because she didn't want to offend them. And that's a very, very common um, attitude among adoptees. Um, she had had non-identifying information supplied to her by the adoption agencies, a lot of which turned out to be incorrect. Uh, she was tested with family tree DNA in 2010, and she said, but, you know, I said, did you have any matches? And she said, well, I have third cousins, fourth cousins, fifth cousins. I don't know how I'm, how I'm connected to them. They don't know how I'm connected to me, and it's, it's far too technical. I'm lost. So I said, well, do test with the other companies, and then drop me an email in six weeks' time, eight weeks' time, when the results come through. So that's what she did. She tested with 23andMe and Ancestry. And six weeks later, I get an email from Winnie saying, oh, I've got a first cousin match with somebody called Nathaniel. And I said, whoa, OK, OK, time out, time out. You need to write your letters. You need to carefully write out everything you want to say. Then you need to go to sleep. And when you wake up in the morning, rewrite the whole thing. And she said, oh, but we're already connected on Facebook. And we swapped photographs. And the family resemblance is amazing. <laughs> oh, OK, ignore what I said. Forget that then. And she said, but I don't think he is my first cousin. So I said, oh, well, why not? Well, she said, I'm 75. He's 35. He's probably the son of my first cousin. I said, well, yeah, that probably makes more sense. Well, send me the results. Let me have a look at the results, and let me see if I can decipher anything else from them. So. We were looking for a first cousin match. Now, we wouldn't know if, if Nate was on Winnie's father's side, in which case it might look like that, or if it was on Winnie's mother's side, in which case it would look something like that. And at this stage, we didn't know whether the connection was through Nate's father or through Nate's mother. So I had a look at the results, um, and if Nathaniel, if Nate was the, first, the son of the first cousin, then we're looking like at this kind of... Uh, uh, connection here. That would be on the father's side, that would be on the mother's side. So this helps position you uh, relative to your match on the family tree, and it's good to have this kind of pictorial diagram in your mind. And if 
Nate was the uh, first cousin once removed of Winnie, then I was expecting that they'd have, on average, six and a quarter percent of DNA shared with each other within a range of maybe 3.3 to 8.5, based on the limited figures we had at that point in time from research that had been done in the genetic genealogy community. But he came back at 9.77. Now, that's outside of the range of first cousins, once removed. It's well within the range of first cousins. So I was thinking, could it possibly be that he is the first cousin after all? And then it suddenly struck me. We weren't looking at first cousins. We were looking at... She hadn't found the son of her first cousin. She'd found the son of a half-sibling, which would share exactly the same amount of DNA as you'd expect with first cousins. So I couldn't believe this when this happened. I said, how can this be so instantaneous? So I contacted my colleague Blaine Bettinger and I said, look, Blaine, 9.77, is there any way it could be a first cousin once removed? And he said, no, no, not at all. It's, it has to be closer than that. I think you're absolutely right. You're looking at the son of a half-sibling. I said, OK, I hope they're setting, sitting down when I send them this email. Um, I also looked at the X matches. And there was a very substantial X match between Winnie and Nate. Now, where would Nate have received his X DNA from? From his father or from his mother? From his mother, because he would have got the Y chromosome from his father. The father would not have given him any X chromosome, any X DNA at all, so that meant that the connection had to be via Nate's mother. So already we're narrowing it down on Nate's side of the family tree to his maternal side. I also looked at the mitochondrial DNA, which remember is passed along the mother, mother, mother line, and it could have been passed, and Nate had exactly the same haplogroup as Winnie, meaning that Winnie's mother could have passed it to Winnie, and then Winnie's mother could have passed it to Nathaniel's mother, who passed it on to Nathaniel himself. So that was one scenario that it could be via Winnie's mother. So now we're narrowing it down to the maternal side on Winnie's side of the family. But then it occurred to me, well, this haplogroup, H11A2, is probably in the general population as well. So another scenario could be it came from uh, the autosomal DNA came from Winnie's mother, and then Winnie's father, rather, and then Winnie's father married somebody or had a second spouse who just happened to have H11A2 in the general population, and the mitochondrial DNA side came from this new spouse. But luckily, because they tested with 23andMe, I was able to see all the people among uh, Winnie's 1,000 matches who were also H11A2, and there was only six of them out of approximately 1,000 people, making it a very rare haplogroup and making the chances of this second scenario something like 0.65% uh, probability. And making this scenario here 99.35% probable. So I send them this email. They both fall off their chairs. And Winnie sends me this, this, this email. She says, I'm on pins and needles awaiting her results because Nate got his mother to do the test. There have been many disappointments and dead ends in my 35 years of searching. I'm afraid to be too hopeful that his mom is truly my half-sister. The last few days have been such an emotional roller coaster. I think that I've run out of tears of joy. So we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and six weeks later, a 25% match with Nate's mother. Winnie had found a half-sibling, and within four days, she was reconnected with four half-siblings who never knew she existed, and she never knew that they existed, as a result of which she wrote to me saying, the last few days have been overwhelmingly wonderful. I've had long conversations with my newly found half-siblings, and we've exchanged more photographs. They say that the resemblance between our shared mother and me is striking. It's just amazing how this family, who a month ago had no idea that I existed, has embraced me with such love and grace, despite having to absorb the shocking news about how we are related. I am so very, very lucky. So that was a wonderful outcome to my first case of helping an adoptee reconnect. But you've heard from me. I actually want you to hear from Winnie herself. So I'm going to turn this off and turn this on.
You always wonder, you know, who, who does make you who you are? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it a combination of both? I Oops, was adopted, and I've had a wonderful life. Um, I've been loved, I've been nurtured, I have wonderful children, wonderful grandchildren, but there's a piece that's not complete. I've been searching for my birth family for about 40 years. I followed every lead I had. Your dad and I went to the Santa Clara County Courthouse and got my whole adoption file. I spent five days going through the 1939 birth indices. I ended up going through 95,000 names. I finally just gave up. I decided I just can't do this anymore. You know, I'm just gonna go to my grave just not knowing who I am. Can, can you hear that okay? Or is this, oh, maybe I have this, uh... This is, uh, can, you hear, can you hear me on the speakers or not? No. <laughs> yes, you can hear me. Try to take it down a little bit. Okay, you can hear me now. Right, okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you a sound check so that these guys, I'm gonna start it again anyway because it's uh, worthwhile listening to this and then we'll see if this level is okay. You always wonder, you know, who does make you who you are? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it a combination of both? I always knew I was adopted, and I've had a wonderful life. Um, I've been loved, I've been nurtured, I have wonderful children, wonderful grandchildren, but there's a piece that's not complete. I've been searching for my birth family for about 40 years. I followed every lead I had. Your dad and I went to the Santa Clara County Courthouse and got my whole adoption file. I spent five days going through the 1939 birth indices. I ended up going through 95,000 names. I finally just gave up. I decided I just can't do this anymore. You know, I'm just going to go to my grave just not knowing who I am. So my son Nathaniel called me and he said, Mom, you know that 23andMe genetic test that I did? I got this email that says I have a first cousin. This geneticist recommended that I do DNA testing. I opened my email and 23andMe had identified what they thought was a first cousin. And of course I thought the whole thing was just crazy, a mistake. And he's a researcher and he's very smart. He says, no, mom, this is like 99.999% a definite relative. Turned out that it wasn't a first cousin. It was a half-nephew, so a half-nephew who's his mom, a half-sister. I'm excited. I'm going to finally meet my siblings. Oh, this is really happening now. Oh, wow. Oh. Hopefully now we can make up for lost time of all those years that we were not together. And of course, another hope is that they're going to like me. Oh. Oh.
sister. I'm still the boss. You know what? Right. So we'll have to talk yeah. about that. Look at the party. Never bought a piece of rabbit. Oh my gosh. Wait, and I can look around. That's my mom. All my life, this is what I wanted to know. This is just incredible. They describe our mom as having many of the same qualities that I have. She loved her children fiercely and nothing would make her happier to know that we're all together. She waited as long as she could. Yeah, she did. And I tried as hard as I could. Uh, I just felt a peace that I have never felt. It was the end of a search. What else can I possibly wish for? I mean, this is utopia. <laughs> All of my life, I've, I've known nothing. Now I know this is me. This is who I am. So you can really see how important this is to Winnie. And uh, a lot of adoptees have this type of um, reaction to discovering who they are. Um, it is hugely life-changing, and like Linny, Winnie said herself, it brings a peace that uh, she never had known before. So now I'm carrying on the other one. I'm going to turn this one off. Good, okay, nothing from the last speakers. That's the way we like to keep it. So when we get our matches, it's usually that we don't find somebody as close as Winnie did in that list of matches. And it usually takes a lot more work to actually figure out who is the birth family and reconnect with half-siblings and birth parents. And um, following this very successful reunion, Winnie took a break and then came back to her DNA a year and a half later. And we spent 18 months tracking down her father's side of the family. And so it's, that would be the usual thing. It would take somewhere but usually around about 12 to 18 months for you to actually reconnect with one birth parent. And then that's usually enough. And you develop a relationship with that family. And of course, Winnie's mother had passed on, so she wasn't able to say who the birth father was. Some people are lucky enough to find a birth parent who is still alive, and they can actually tell you who the birth father was or who the birth mother was. So this process of uh, reconnecting with birth family usually involves looking at the matches. This is a, a, a brief summary of some, of some matches that you might get. You might get a first cousin, a second cousin, a third cousin. How many people have tested with ancestry? Okay, so quite a few. How many people have tested only with my heritage? Only one, two, uh, three, anybody, four, anyone who's only tested with um, 23andMe? Only with 23andMe, no. And how many people have only tested with family tree DNA? So there's a few people that have only tested with family tree DNA. So it'll be similar, whatever company you, you uh, test with, you get a list of matches and you get an estimate of how closely related you are to each of them. With Ancestry, which again is the uh, recommended testing company to start with. There are sometimes a spanner in the works. These people have no family tree, apparently, and you will need to have the family tree in order to make uh, advances and to try and see where uh, various family trees intersect. So that's a spanner in the works. Here's another spanner in the works. This tree is locked. It is private. And you have to do that incredibly difficult thing of writing to somebody and saying hello. And that is a very, very difficult thing to say because they may not say hello back. <laughs> so um, I always try to do as much as I can without going to contact other people, at least initially. 
Um, but if we click on one of these that didn't have a family tree, look down here. It says select a tree to preview. And if we, oh well, first of all, this little eye icon shows you the uh, total amount of centimorgans. That's very important. Um, but this little text box down here says, says select a tree to preview. If we click on that, it has the Kyver family tree. So there is a family tree. The reason why it says no family tree is because the DNA has not been linked to that family tree. So whenever you see no family tree, always go and look exploring to see if there actually is one. It's just not linked to the DNA. And if we click on the Kyver family tree, it produces a whole big <coughs> set of uh, ancestors that will be very, very helpful when we come to looking for a common ancestor with these close matches. So no family tree does not mean no family tree. There may be a family tree there, and all you have to do is go looking for it. Now, I assume that the home person in this family tree is the person who's done the DNA test. They just haven't bothered linking their DNA to the family tree. That is not always the case. Sometimes the home person um, is the wife or the spouse of the person who did the DNA, and she's just managing the kit. So you cannot automatically assume that the DNA is associated with this home person in the family tree. But at least you're in a much better position than if there was no family tree at all. I'm introducing three essential concepts. This one is the red herring. This one is the spanner in the works. And both of them can lead on to what is this? It's not a wild goose chase, it's a wild swan chase. That's a swan. You see how easy it is to be misled. Um, so it makes the point that uh, a lot of the time there will be something that stops us from uh, progressing as smoothly as we would like. And the sort of red herrings would be false positive matches. And that only tends to happen when you get down to the very small segments, like anything less than 10, I wouldn't bother with at all. And in fact, for this type of work, we're looking at the total amount of centimorgans, the total amount of DNA shared, and I generally only get excited by anything over 100 centimorgans. Anything less than 100 centimorgans, there's a lot less that I can do with that, unless there's a shared match with somebody who is greater than 100 centimorgans, and in those cases, I'll take a look at it. Spanner in the works may include nobody responds to your inquiry and you're left with tumbleweed and no response. That can be terrible, especially when you find a first cousin for the adoptee and they never bother responding. So you're so close and you still can't get any closer. No family tree available, that is a major stumbling block. Inaccurate family trees. How many people have found inaccurate family trees on Ancestry? Hello, well, we're all in good company. Um, there may be a generation gap and people get confused with this once removed, second cousin once removed. If there is a generation gap, then that can throw a spanner in the works. There may also be a second connection. It's cousins marrying cousins. So you might be heading in this direction when in fact the connection is over there instead. And it's because cousins marrying cousins can really confuse the situation. The other thing that might happen is you get a very close match, as happened to me with one of my early cases. Uh, the adoptee found a first cousin match in her ancestry results, wrote to this uh, first cousin match and said, hi, I'm an adoptee, anything you can do to help me would be really gratefully appreciated. And the match wrote back and saying, I'd love to help, but I'm adopted too. <laughs> so that threw a spanner in the works as well. Expect the unexpected. The unexpected does happen, and sometimes it happens twice. So the story ain't over till the fat lady sings. And even after she's sung, she might drop a real clangor on the stage. So expect the unexpected. Now, I've developed this step-by-step -step approach for adoptees or foundlings or people who have an illegitimate grandfather. Um, I've adopted this approach to try and make it as simple as possible. And I'm just going to run through this in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. The first step is, can you identify a common ancestor? And that means asking three questions. Are there any close matches among the adoptees' matches? Do any of them match each other? So we'll be looking at shared matches, in common with matches, relatives in common. And thirdly, can you triangulate on a common ancestor using the family trees from these matches who match each other? 
So before that, let's look at how you position people on the family tree. Uh, for example, if you have a third cousin match, then you share great, great grandparents in common with each other. And if you share great, well, if I have a third cousin match, there's me down there in 1960. My great, great grandparents would be born around about 1835. And that is just about as far as Irish records will extend. So that's about as far as I can go as a third cousin match. If I go up to a fifth cousin match, that fifth cousin, uh, the common ancestor will be a four times great grandparent born around about 1765. That's way beyond the reach of documentary records in Ireland, hopeless. So I am restricted in the, the uh, closeness of the relationships that I can use. I can use anything back to third cousins relatively confidently. When I get to fourth and fifth cousins, the chances of me being able to connect family trees together is very remote because there are no records available. So the Shared Centre Morgan project was set up by Blaine Bettinger and he has assessed more than 25,000 known relationships and has built these wonderful histograms and frequency distribution charts of the amount of DNA that is shared for each type of relationship. So for example, here you are here in the middle, there's yourself you and your sibling will share 2,629 centimorgans of DNA on average, but you can see the range just below that. So he has this wonderful chart that gives you the average and then the range. Um, it's very important to know what the age of your match is. If you're 75 and your match is 35, then you're, there's going to be a generation gap more than likely. If the DNA comes back suggesting your second cousin's once removed, then it's going to be great-grandparent on your side, great-great-grandparent on your match's side, but triangulating on that same common ancestral couple, your great-grandparents, his great-great-grandparents. This is an example of one of the charts they have at the very end of the document, which you can download for free from his website, and it gives you the average amount of DNA shared for each of these types of relationship, it gives you the minimum observed among these 25,000 people and the maximum observed among these 25,000 people. And you have these wonderful histograms there that show you the spread of DNA for any given relationship. So you have an average estimate in the middle and around that average you have a range of DNA values that can be quite low for that relationship or quite high for that relationship. Here's second cousins once removed. The average is 123 centimorgans, and you can see that this particular bar here is 107 centimorgans up to 124. So the average is somewhere around here, but you can see that there's a spread on either side of this average, and it's not normally distributed. It's not that bell-shaped curve. It's actually skewed towards this end, towards the right-hand side of the curve. So any match over 100 centimorgans is worth exploring. Um, again, second cousin once removed means great-grandparent on your side and great-great-grandparent on their side. But which of your four sets of great-grandparents is it on your side? Which of the eight sets of great-great-grandparents is it on your match's side? And this is, of course, presuming that all of your great-grandparents married each other and that one of their children was not born on the wrong side of the blanket. <laughs> not sure if you have that expression here. It means an extramarital affair. Just <laughs> make sure I get a message across. So usually our grandparents married, married each other rather than having children individually, but that wasn't always the case. But most of the time you will be looking for a great grandparental couple, a pair of married people, rather than an individual. So, Coming back to step one, are there any close matches? And do they match each other? Well, here's Ancestry, for example, and we have four close matches uh, at a second cousin level. And I really uh, am very hopeful when I see this. We've got a blue second cousin, a purple, a green, and a red. So there are close matches. There's four close matches at the second cousin level. I'm very encouraged by this result. Let me click on the blue one and see first of all, view match, and then click on shared matches, 
Oh, and the blue second cousin matches the second second cousin. So they have a common ancestor in common with each other, as well as in common with the adoptee. And the trick then is to look at the family trees and see where that common ancestor is. What I'm hoping for is that in the same way that the adoptee is a second cousin to the blue and a second cousin to the red, I'm hoping the blue and the red are second cousins to each other as well, and all three of these people will triangulate on the same great grandparental couple. So exploring your closest matches involves identifying which matches are shared matches. Um, they're called shared matches on ancestry. They're called in common with matches on family tree DNA. They're called relatives in common on 23andMe. And the idea is to compare the trees and identify where they sit in relation to each other and in that way see if you can identify a shared ancestry, ancestor or ancestral couple to all three of them. And that's where you find the shared matches on ancestry. We've already made the point that the little uh, eye icon there, the blue circle with the eye in it, gives you the total amount of centimorgans, which is this one here. We've also shown you that no family tree sometimes means that there is a family tree, and you just have to go, go and select it and it'll show you. So that's ancestry. Um, the shared matches on family tree DNA are called in common with matches, so you would tick the first match, the closest match, and then click on the in common with button to actually find the shared matches on family tree DNA. And then on 23andMe, you click on the relatives in common. So you actually click on your uh, closest match, go to relatives in common, and it'll give you a list of all of the matches you share in common with each other. There's the list of matches there. Uh, here's you, and here's how much DNA you share with each of them. And here is that first match and all of the DNA that you share with each of these shared matches. Now 23andMe uses percentage rather than centimorgans, which is the unit of the quantity of DNA shared, to convert from percentage to DNA to centimorgans, multiply roughly by 70. If you multiply by 70, that will convert from percentage to centimorgans. So those are the three main um, websites and how you find these shared matches. Once you find these shared matches, you need to get hold of their family trees. And that can be a very difficult step. So hopefully they all have family trees. And then the trick is to try to triangulate on the common ancestor. And in the, the case that we've just shown, um, it's possible that the, these second cousins share a common great grandparental couple. So we're looking at people born around about the 1870 mark, well within the range of most documentary records. And that's the kind of uh, family tree you're going to create. You're going to identify great grandparental couple number A. And you've got B, C, and D to identify. Uh, in the ideal situation, you would identify all four sets of great grandparents. So you'd get this kind of scenario. Now, at this stage, we're calling them A, B, C, D, but of course, identifying a set of great grandparents in isolation, you don't know whether it's A, B, C, or D. It could be any one of those. So you still don't know where to place this set within the overall family tree for the adoptee. Um, you're still going to have this brick wall, of course, and you need to be mindful of that. I use a, a simple Excel spreadsheet to summarize all of these close matches and the matches that match each other. And it summarizes the path to the common ancestor for multiple matches from different websites, Ancestry here, MyHeritage there, 23andMe there, and all on the one page. Because otherwise you have to have four computer screens open at the same time and you'll be going from this one to that one and it's very easy to get lost. So what I do is something as simple as this, and I, as a reference from the shared Centimorgan project, I put the average amount of DNA shared for a variety of relationships. Second cousins once removed share about 129. This person here is AB. This is one of the close matches of the adoptee. They share 107, which is somewhere between second cousin once removed and third cousin. I'm going to guess second cousin once removed. Uh, the next yellow one down is EF. 
where it shares 161 centimorgans, which is a little bit higher than the average for second cousin once removed, and that's from my heritage. And then the, the fourth one down, GH, 122 centimorgans, and that's very close to the average for second cousin once removed. And then we've got somebody here with 42, somebody here with 35. But I have access to their family trees, and they all go back to Curtis Phelan and Mary Ann Moorfield. Curtis and Mary Ann, Curtis and Mary Ann, Curtis and Mary Ann, Curtis and Mary Ann. These are their great great grandparents and um, great grandparents to the adoptee. Because the DNA is suggesting the adopt there is a generation gap, and the adoptee is probably going to sit somewhere around there. And because I have these people's family tree, I know that there are uh, three additional children of Curtis and Mary Ann whose descendants have not tested. So we have descendants of these children here who have tested, but Winnie is going to be the grandchild of one of these women here. So it's putting all the information together into a simple spreadsheet, so just at one glance you can see exactly what you're looking at. And of course the descendants of these people are either going to be first cousins or half-siblings to the adoptee. And eventually you'll be approaching them to do DNA testing. So that's the first step. The second step is tracing the living descendants downwards. And you can see how those can be documented in that spreadsheet as well. And this involves uh, building mirror trees on ancestry. And uh, I always make them private and unsearchable because you want to keep your search private because you want to preserve the privacy of the adoptee. So make these trees private and make them unsearchable just by clicking the link, the uh, tick boxes under the settings uh, tab on Ancestry. And the idea here is to build the family tree forward rather than building the family tree back. So you're building the family tree forward to the present day. Very time consuming. Um, it is increased if the common ancestor is further back, which is why I don't like working with anything more than third cousins. Um, if working with fourth cousins, there's going to be thousands of descendants and you don't know which one is going to be the relevant one for your adoptee. Also, the more children they have in each branch, the more work you have to do. Um, ancestry is the easiest research tool to use because you have access to the records, you have access to other people's trees, and you can ask the tree owners questions and do a sense check of your own genealogical research. So this is the most time consuming. It might be quite easy to triangulate on the common ancestor, but then to build the tree forward to the present day takes an awful lot of time, and you will constantly be plagued by the nagging question, is my tree accurate? Because if your tree is not accurate, it will send you on a wild swan chase. <laughs> Step two, tracing down until the trees intersect. The one good trick that you can use is, of course, if you've identified two sets of great-grandparents, hopefully, if you trace them downwards, you'll find that some of the descendants from set A marry into the descendants from set B. And that can be really, really, you know, that's the, the, when you discover that, the first thing you say is, bingo. You've found the link. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we don't know what order A, B, and C, and D are in. And here's an example where the order is C, B, D, and A. So this then identifies the grandparents, and then one of the children will be the birth father or birth mother of the adoptee. Now, the typical records that I use for Irish research would be the two census records, uh, the civil records from 1864 onwards, church records going back to maybe about 1900 or so, and then for the recent records, I'll be using family trees on ancestry. So I'll be searching ancestry for people who have not DNA tested, but actually have some of the ancestors that are relevant in their family tree. I'll be searching online obituaries, online newspapers, Facebook is a great place for the more modern, uh, more up-to-date uh, families. I'll be simply be Googling people as well and seeing what turns up. And of course, electoral rolls uh, will be very, very useful as well. The third step, can you identify the most likely candidate? And that means eliminating non-contenders, perhaps making cautious inquiries with more distant cousins, 
uh, preparing yourself to actually reveal the full story when they come to you and they say, you know, just exactly why are you helping this person with their family tree? What's going on? And then I'll say to the adoptee, do you want me to answer this or do you want to answer that? Uh, eventually the adoptee will get involved and tell the full story, especially when we get to close family members. And we may ask selective people in the family tree of interest to do DNA testing to see if it's on this side or if it's on that side. And eliminating non-contenders means, well, if you know who the birth mother is, then you only have to focus on the birth father, and so all female offspring can be excluded because a female cannot be a birth father. Um, offspring who died before childbearing age, well, they can't be a birth father or a birth mother. Offspring who were born abroad, elsewhere, and never came back to visit the place where the adoptee was conceived or born. Offspring who died before the adoptee was conceived. These are all children of the descend or descendants of this uh, common ancestral couple that you can eliminate. Uh, you're looking for people in the wrong place at the wrong time so you can cross them off as possible candidates for the birth mother or birth father. Then you start making cautious inquiries of distant cousins, find other people researching the common ancestor, like I say, doing a tree search on ancestry, checking the accuracy of your tree against theirs to make sure you haven't made a mistake, which is gonna send you on a wild goose chase. Um, ask them if uh, the information that you have is accurate. Um, identify potential direct descendants and then eventually ask them if they have been DNA tested and if not, would they like to be DNA tested? And then you reveal the full story um, I always like getting the adoptee to speak in his or her own words. I get them to write a message, email it to me, and I will copy and paste it into a message to the match on Ancestry saying, I'd like to get Carol to tell you in her, her story in her own words, and I will be the technical support and background. The two of you should now continue having the conversation between each other because you are related to each other, and I'll be here as technical support if you need me. So that means getting the adoptee to speak, and that's very, very important because it is the adoptee's story. Step four, and this is the last of, uh, the, almost to the last slide, you make contact uh, with the birth family and confirm the connection via DNA. And that's fine, for example, if you've narrowed it down to um, two siblings. But supposing you've narrowed it down to 11 siblings then you have to go to each of those siblings or the descendants of those siblings and DNA test every single one of them until you find the right one. Or somebody might have family lore and say, yes, it was me, I am the birth mother. Um, but if the birth parent is no longer alive and it's only the children of the birth parent you're, you're dealing with, they may never have known that their, their mother had had a child she gave up for adoption. Not, even the birth father may never have known that he caught somebody pregnant. So you have to keep these things in mind. Um, selective testing then of the close family has to be done very delicately because you do not know what kind of pan of worms you're opening, whether it's Pandora's box. You'd never know what kind of situation you're stepping into. Uh, you need to manage expectations on both the adoptee's side and the birth family's side. Um, and then waiting for those results is one of the most nerve-wracking things you can go through. It either confirms or refutes your theory, and like I said at the beginning, expect the unexpected. So if you do get a positive match, what then? Well, the reconnection can be an emotional roller coaster on both sides. You have to have your support network ready. Set your expectations to low or medium and anything above that is going to be a bonus. A lot of adoptees go in with very high expectations and come out disappointed. So you have to manage those expectations on both sides of the family. You have to be patient, you have to be kind to yourself and to the people that you're dealing with. You need to take time to build a relationship, not just with your immediate birth family, half siblings and birth parents, you need to build a relationship with your second cousins and your first cousins because frequently the relationship you have with them will be a lot better than the relationship you have with your half-siblings. So build those relationships and take time to do them. 
you also need to be able to put the whole thing aside and go skiing down in Dunedin or have a little bit of a holiday and just put it to one side because it can be totally time consuming, totally consume all your energy and it can be very, very draining as well. But more than anything else, you should enjoy the journey because as we saw with Winnie, it can have a wonderful day in the morning. Thank you very much. And just to remind you, there, uh, the videos will be available on my YouTube channel, DNA and Family Tree Research, in a few weeks' time. And there is a DNA sale on for Ancestry Kits at the moment. I will be at the back of the room in case anybody wants to ask any questions. Right. Well, yes, you can go into I'll have a cup of tea, but I'll be outside. And nobody can go to take care for that. And then I'll give some notices, and then everybody will probably spot you. No, that's fine. I welcome inquiries. I welcome Thank you, Morris. That was absolutely great, wasn't it? Yeah,